Good morning, everyone. Uh, I believe we are now live. Uh, so welcome to the day four of the NHSR Community Conference. Uh, you hopefully should hear me and you should see the screen, which is now our program. So please say hi. And also you can see where you're from and what, how is the weather, because apparently it's shining in, the Gloucest in Gloucestershire and West Midlands, uh, um, based near Birmingham, which is an interesting change. Uh, but anyway, uh, Moving towards our day today, we have a quite interesting lineup of speakers. We have an amazing uh, charity representation from Kate Chima, who's going to speak to us shortly. Uh, we, also will, uh, we will also hear uh, from uh, Sandro, um, from Mark Aquila, I hope I pronounced it right. Uh, he will be speaking about uh, how to prevent human trafficking via analytics. This is exciting. Um, we will hear from Gary Hudson, who I can see uh, just confirmed that it's shining in Nottingham. And you will also hear from uh, William uh, from Data Lab, um, Ben uh, Goldacker mentioned his talk uh, during um, Monday opening. We will hear about how to train analysts and uh, how to perform news and news to during COVID pandemic, as well as we will be closing uh, with Michael Hurst from Health Economics Outcomes Research talking about uh, providing structured messy data. And uh, this day is a bit different compared to last um, previous days this week. We will have uh, our American colleagues joining in. That's why we have afternoon a bit later this time. So about quarter to four ish, please join us. Um, we will start from uh, some uh, talk about our markdown. Uh, we'll have Tom from our studio. Uh, we will then have Carson, James and Kelly, uh, who will talk about various things. You can see the, the topics on the program. And last but not least, we'll have Alison Hurst. And I'm sure many of you heard about her at least during the conference. Or so you saw her amazing illustrations on, on Twitter. She's doing a fantastic job in R, and you will never believe the pictures she produces are actually done in R. Um, but moving on, I'm sure everyone who attended every day now bored of this, but yes, please participate in chat and please ask your questions and please what questions you like. You should hopefully all have instructions uh, in the email how to use Crowdcast, but I will quickly go through this in a second. Uh, please use Twitter, we have hashtag and follow us and like questions you like, sorry, comments you like and questions you like if someone asks a question on Twitter. Um, also, we have Slack uh, and we would love to have you here. It's not complicated at all. Just follow this tiny URL, finish setting up your account and you will see there is conference channel. Um, we had taxi time, it's a session to follow, but actually it just passed. Uh, but I'm sure many of you heard about this, you now uh, have collaboration with Time Bank. And also, please, please be very polite and kind to everyone around you, um, because it's all about our community. It's all about kindness. And uh, as I said, very quick instructions. Again, I, I believe everyone now found chat box because I can see lovely uh, messages are coming. Uh, also, you can ask a question, you can ask a question button, and you also can vote on questions you like. There is this arrow, orange arrow, so you can vote on questions. And uh, you can move from session to session. Please stay here for now. Uh, and then you also will be moved automatically when session is live. But you can also move yourself and you can move to session retrospectively if you want to uh, look at the sessions you missed. And I believe this is everything from me for now. Uh, so I'm stopping share my screen and I'll give it to Janine now. Good morning, I'm Janine Della from the Strategy Unit and I'm facilitating all morning with you today, which is great. So I get to listen to all of the um, sessions that we've got today. I'm about to hand over to Kate Chima, who is the Director of Health Intelligence at the British Heart Foundation. Um, Kate's the current Director of Health Intelligence at the British Heart Foundation. She's got a background in health analysis in the NHS. Her focus is on the effective and meaningful use of health and care data to highlight inequalities and opportunities to improve care for millions of people with heart and circulatory disease. Kate is passionate about the benefit high quality analysis can bring to bettering health and care services for all and believes that investing in the development of health analysis can make that utopia a reality. So I'm going to be quiet now and hand over to Kate who's going to take us through her session this morning. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Janine. And good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. I feel like a slight interloper. Um, 
in an NHSR uh, conference. So uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to chat to you today. Just a quick disclaimer, I am not an R expert. I am personally kind of describe myself as an enthusiastic dabbler, but I represent a team that, with, that has amazing skills and I really hope to do them justice. My aim today is less to teach you kind of new things. I'm not going to be sharing lots of code and, and kind of deep insights, but more to share our experiences and challenges and hopefully be useful to those of you who might just be starting out on the R journey in your organizations or maybe are finding yourself in a in in needing to make the case for a change. A uh, really quick background around the BHF. Uh, been around about 60 years. It's our 60th birthday next year. Our primary purpose is to fund research into heart and circulatory disease. And I'm just a quick shout out to Richard Issett, who's on the call, who's one of our amazing BHF funded researchers. Um, but heart and circulatory disease is a big portfolio. That's heart disease, stroke, diabetes, vascular dementia, a whole range of risk factors. But as well as our research portfolio, we also seek to influence policy, health services. We provide information and support to people with heart and circulatory disease and ultimately look to take the results of some of that kind of world leading research and translate it into benefits for the 7.4 million people uh, living with heart and circulatory diseases in the UK. This is the, the, the graphic of our strategy, which has four pillars. And as I said, research is absolutely at the center of it. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk to you about BHF strategy. But I just wanted to note, really, that whilst I'm here today in the context of health intelligence, so I kind of work with the kind of data that all of you guys are used to working with that I work with for years in the health service focus very much on patients the public health services etc there are other intelligence teams across the organization that support these other pillars so that may be in in the in the research funding space so understanding the research landscape and our place in it and obviously from this you know when we think about supporting um uh, are growing our income and support. There's a whole host of really interesting, but very different from health and care data sitting in that space. So we're quite, as, as an organization, from an intelligence perspective, we are quite a multidisciplinary team. I mean, we've got this wide range of different data and data sets, but most of what I'm missing the examples and what I'm going to talk to you about today is from the health health and care space, uh, because that's what, that, that's what I do. I'm being very selfish about it. Um, when I was thinking about how I would kind of frame this talk, I was kind of thinking about decent analogies for a journey and, and came up with a whole range of, of rubbish ideas. Um, but I was reflecting on where I started personally, and I started properly to learn our last year before I started the BHF, when I took four weeks off paid work. I did not, well, I went to festivals, I don't know if anyone remembers those. Um, but one of the th I kind of set myself in those four weeks a few really nerdy self improvement goals, and one of them was to open you know, here's one I got um, was to open this book and uh, teach myself a bit of R using a data set from my local gym. That's a very different and long story. One of the other things that I was trying to do at the same time was get into open water swimming. Now I can almost hear your eyes rolling across the country. Um, so go on, bite. Go on, give me a fact. So what does R and open water swimming have in common? Well, right now, open water swimming is more accurately, accurately described as bloody freezing cold water swimming. And when we think of it in that, those terms, uh, actually, the journey to R and the journey to cold water swimming is pretty similar. So let me explain. There are four stages to a cold water swim. And they really did genuinely mirror the stages that we went and instilled and instill, you know, we are still actually going through with R at the BHF. So what stage one? Stage one, if I can move the slide on. Come on. That's okay. Stage one. Why on earth am I doing this? That water looks really cold. What exactly do those ducks think they're doing? Um this is answering the why question and at the BHF when we really started to think about as a, you know as a kind of core organization why should we start using R how can we kind of frame this in the case for change it was quite auspicious timing because we were in the process of uh, developing our health intelligence strategy and it was pretty clear already that there were pretty compelling reasons to get to grips with R as a as a as a new as a critical tool in our analytical toolbox 
to help us solve a number of problems. And I'm sure that many of these will be familiar to many of you. I, I refer to them as the three bigs, big spreadsheets. <laughs> Number one, unstable, baffling if you weren't the one who, uh, who built it. Big ambitions, a really clever bunch of people. Uh, I lead a, a remarkable team um, myself and there are you know, really talented analysts across, across the organization. Uh, who can see the, the opportunities presented to us by the kind of wealth of data, both quantitative and qualitative, I should say, that we have access to, um, who, want, who want to do more with it. Uh, and really, frankly, and this leads on to, on to uh, issue three, don't quite have the time. So we have big capacity. And even more so now, where we're in quite constrained circumstances, we need to be able to streamline the time that we spent on the big spreadsheets so that we've got time to, to think about and, and develop our big ambitions. The advent of COVID-19 only exacerbated this. Uh, you know, any All of these issues as kind of the demand went up. So at this stage, we kind of found it was quite psychological. I think from a, uh, a kind of intellectual perspective, myself and a couple of other uh, intelligence team leaders across the organization said, well, we kind of know that we want to do this, but we, we you know, how how what's how do we start what you know where where do we go to and that kind of stage is is quite psychological you know, just like with the the cold water it's largely a fear of the unknown and it was hugely helpful to see uh fr friends and colleagues uh, some of whom are, are on this call uh others you know some of the some of the grandees and then obviously uh you know people within the NHSR community you know, metaphorically being the people who were already paddling around the lake. Look, they've managed it. I'm sure we can. Which kind of leads us on to our step two. Again, if I can get my slide to move on a bit. There you go. Dipping your toes. So, it, it, yeah, at this stage, you find out that that water is bloody cold. But you don't appear to have frostbite quite yet. It's quite reassuring. So it's probably fair to reflect that initially at the BHF, our use of R was pretty piecemeal. The old bit of analysis here or there, uh, discovering a new package, frissons of excitement across the office floor when we were still in an office. Um, it, you know, it was as much to develop our own skills or explore a new package as much as anything else. And, and actually, that, that was kind of fair enough. So some of the team were better versed in its usage than others. One of my team has a, is, has a data science background and used it quite extensively before which was very helpful. Um, and we even, we moved quite quickly. We even kind of dipped our toes into shiny a bit, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. Here's a couple of just kind of one-off things we did with R and they're just they're just visuals. There's obviously a, a nice code underneath. So we, we, mapped, we used it in our, uh, quite a lot for our air pollution campaign, which you might've seen at the, the back end of 2019. We did a lot of SPC, so kind of understanding trends, um, so this is just one SPC chart in a in a panoply, a constellation of SPC that we generated around key risk factors. And yeah, we, we did a bit of mucking about with GIFs. We had a bit of fun. And I'm very happy to admit that um, not all of it was useful. But this was a critical learning point for us because by giving a bit of time to have a bit of a play, be a bit creative, not only were we building skills and building enthusiasm, new ideas and novel approaches. Having that bit of fun was time time really well spent. And even at this really early dipping toe stage, we saw really clear benefits. So replicability, obviously, that map that you can see there on the left has undergone loads of updates, switches between parliamentary constituency versions, local authority versions, CCG, you name it. We've had the boundaries on that particular map. And that was quick and easy to realize once the core script was written, Bish bash, but it was really nice and you know, re a really clear, uh, nice example of how uh, utilizing this you know, R as a, as, a, as a system or as an approach can save huge amounts of time. And, and also on the data wrangling side of things, I think if I personally had a Damascene moment, if there was any lingering doubt in my mind that this is the route we needed to go down, um, it, was, it was absolutely put to bed when I learned how to do gather in dplyr and took hours and hours off my off, off my off my data wrangling days really really uh useful stuff so uh, early lessons um 
lots of fun had, but not by any means kind of systematic uh, and certainly not quite or out, outside of the, the kind of gift stuff that everyone loves, right? Um, not really making that kind of fundamental case for change at an organizational level. So stage three, shoulders under, <clears throat> brace yourself, get moving. Because if you keep moving in cold water, at least you're far less likely to die. Um, but building on our smaller successes, we started to become a bit more joined up. So most notably, this is the point at which we started to bring together multiple teams. So it wasn't just us in health intelligence having a marvelous time. It, um, we did some joint training with, with colleagues from uh, marketing and customer insight. Um, it, uh, you know, you know GG plot, dplyr, kind of nice and basic stuff. It was a team bonding experience, sure, as far as remote training ever can be, but it also gave us the beginnings of a shared language. So where we were working on the same projects, which is not not unusual, um, we we were talking in the same terms. It was it was actually really 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 useful. We developed a bit more to using R for whole projects. So having whole projects to hang analysis off has been an important part of our journey because it means that we're able to then describe our whole analytical narrative in, in R. Um, and some of the scripts that we've got describe entire projects end to end. I'm gonna give you just two really quick examples. Um, the first one is, is the circuit, this is the National Defibrillator Network. So we're leading on the rollout of a National Defibrillator Database to make sure that all of these you know, the potential life-saving devices are being are accessible and used uh, to their full potential. So we work quite a lot with, or we're in the process of rolling that out across all the ambulance services. The so R has been used. It, it, it's obviously not used for, for the front end of NDN. That's you know that that's a bit of, of proprietary software, um, but it has been used for a lot of our kind of marketing stratification work for targeting of corporate uh, defibrillator owners. Um, if anyone wants to know more about this, by the way, do drop drop me a line. Um, and also kind of proof proof of concepts and approaches for uh, at the moment with uh, defibrillators are mapped using postcodes. You want to move away from that to more of a geographical base. And we've done all the proof of concept work, which will then be built into the main system uh, in R. Um, and again, really quick scripts that we've been able to share with developers across, organi across organizations as well as internally. Um, hugely, hugely useful. Um, I our second example, because no presentation would be complete without mention of COVID, um, is our is our has been we have done all of our COVID response work in our all of it um, from regular reporting, which is now completely automated using our markdown, uh, you know, key stats and fact sheets, supports our media work and fundraising colleagues, to tracking service issues from our help desk, um, understanding the kind of things that uh, people are calling our heart helpline about. We've even done social network analysis as part of the evaluation for our internal COVID response. Um, I haven't shown it here, but we, we have worked quite a lot with um, kind of text analytics and sentiment analysis as well. In our, again, really, really useful, super quick, some great packages out there. In the grand scheme of text and analytics and sentiment analysis, fairly basic, but very quick and enabled us to focus um, uh, focus on, on areas of support that are you know that our patients and beneficiaries were asking about very very quickly um, our key lesson here really has been to keep going so some some elements of this if I think about the regular reporting particularly it was quite tempting at points in time to just kind of slip back and revert into something comfortable in Excel because we can turn it around on a dime. But in the longer term, we'd have to keep turning it around on a dime every time we wanted to refresh the report. Um, so th that initial investment um, and, and kind of sticking to the guns, not only capitalised on new skills, but it absolutely ensured that we, um, that in, in the longer term, we could be much more responsive. The other big learning for us at this point, this is where the community around R really came into its own. And I, I was reflecting with with a very old friend of mine a couple of days ago um, who is still stuck using SPSS in, in their current job. I haven't used SPSS since I was an undergraduate, um, but we had no support at all. If you tried to, tried to reach out to a community, 
it, it was quite difficult. And a lot of other packages that I've used previously, you just haven't had that that wealth and you know, access to expertise that you have with R. I'm going to give two really specific shout outs. Our COVID, our COVID uh, kind of regular reporting wouldn't have got over the line if we hadn't pilfered, frankly, some of the open code from uh, a, a chap called Cal Colin Angus, who wouldn't know me from Adam. We follow each other on Twitter, um, but his GitHub repository has been really helpful. So thanks, Colin. Um, and a, a, a series of, uh, of blogs by a, a lady called Shirin Elzinghorst. Uh, tutorials on social network analysis in R, and she used games of Game of Thrones data, which I thought was really apt, given what I was trying to do with it. Um, just you know, remarkable uh, and you know, free to access um, uh, resources that you know, the, the benefit of which is you know, just just cannot be overstated. Can I give you a four minute warning? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so stage four, I'm nearly there, keeping warm, the endorphins are wearing off, it's all been very exciting, now my teeth are starting to chatter. So you might be tempted to think that this, is, this journey has all been fine and dandy, but actually we've had a couple and continue to have significant challenges that, that is kind of preventing us from moving up to the next level. So R is obviously just one tool in the proverbial toolbox. And although we've identified it as, as a strategic choice in our information strategy, it means different things to different teams. It's become quite synonymous with a data science label, which means different things to different people. So we're finding that we can trans, trans that translates into problems if a, if a particular project doesn't have a data science tag on it. We end up using it anyway, but it becomes a guerrilla enterprise rather than that systematic scaling up that we want to have. So this in turn has kind of led to concerns with security and safety, which I'm sure many of you would have come across. The enthusiasm and joy of discovering new packages doesn't always translate into good governance. Okay, I, I might I might be guilty of that myself. Um, but we there's a bit of a chicken and egg without being able to demonstrate the benefit. We're never going to be able to convince other colleagues that we want to kind of um, you know, download all this stuff, and that that's been the major major stumbling block block with Shiny because we we're not getting anywhere with convincing people we want a Shiny server so that we can do authentic so we can have authentication. Um, BHF is a Microsoft house, and it's proving difficult to prove to colleagues that R provides us with additional functionality and flexibility beyond what the current technology stack can, can give us. So I think overall we're you know coming back to our cold water analogy we're on the point of moving on from swimming in a lake to throwing ourselves into a wide open ocean. I think the future of R is reasonably secure but we have made progress it feels a bit fragile. We're really committed to sharing our approaches and part of the reason I find events like this so valuable is to see the art of the possible and how far people have come kind of in, in the intervening months since I was here last year. So hopefully, if you're now standing in front of that metaphorical body of cold water, scratching your head, thinking, what am I doing here? Or just dipping a toe, I, I hope that you know our story has helped in a small way to show the art of the possible. And you know, if you're thinking about returning back to that warm house, I hope that I've presented enough of a reason to, to jump right in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a fantastic um presentation we've had loads of really good um chats through the um chat box but we've also got four questions i don't think we're going to get through all four of them but our most popular question is can the bhf share their defib their sorry teeth defibrillation location mapping data on nhsr data sets uh, that, I, I'll need to check that. We've got very strict governance around the data that's in the NDN. Um, so uh, I'll have to get back to you. Sorry. OK, our second one is as a requirement of any BHF funded researchers to openly publish any papers from it. Is there a move to include data analysis in this and are researchers being encouraged to use R or other obviously not so good open source languages? So in terms of the we we're not prescriptive in terms of what um what researchers use um we do however encourage people wherever we can to to share their analysis and share their 
code if that's relevant, but we don't have a central repository for doing so. Um, one of the things that, um, and again, thanks Richard for mentioning it, one of the things that I'm quite keen to do is develop a BHFR user group which incorporates people who are funded by the BHF in their research who are using R to start to pull together some of those questions and and, and think about a more cohesive way of doing it, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you. I'm going to, it's 9.40 on the dot, so I'm going to call a halt there. Thank you very much. Lots of chats, lots of claps and lots of thanks in the chat. I hope you can see them, Kay, and thanks everybody else. I will see you in the next session. Thanks very much.